Hello, everybody, and welcome to our uh, podcast. And today I have with me Kalle Lundahl. Hello. And Henrik Gustafsson sitting Hello. in Stockholm. And uh, me and Kalle Lundahl, we are situated uh, on the only mountain in the province of Närke. And it's called Kjelltopskullen. It's also a hill with a lot of statues, uh, at least a dozen, could be more. And because of the hefty wind, uh, we are today situated behind the Ark. Of Noah. Of Noah, we say. It's Ark of Noah. Thank God it's a little smaller, but when it comes to the wind, it could have been a little bit bigger. And today's subject actually is going to be a video proposed by Henrik. And it's called, Does Consciousness Influence Quantum Mechanics? And it's coming from a special channel called PBS Space Time. Uh, and it's, of course, uh, related to the public broadcast service. What is the title of the video? <clears throat> uh, yes, I'm coming to that. Asked, what is beyond the edge of the universe? There you have the sound. Uh, it's called quantum mechanics and consciousness. And in the beginning, the introducer, a very eloquent and uh, clear introducer, says there is a general conception that consciousness has a role to play in quantum mechanics. And that consciousness actually influences the material world. And that he says in the really beginning of the video. And he goes then over to explain uh, general suppositions about quantum mechanics and the development. And he later, maybe 10, 15, 12 minutes in, I think, into the video, he explains that uh, the founders of quantum mechanics and uh, the absolute majority of uh, quantum mechanics today do not agree anymore on the idea that uh, human consciousness has a role to play in reality. It doesn't affect anything. Uh, if, the, if there is any effect at all, it's non negligible It's very, very small, but it does not uh, make a difference whether you're conscious or not. Or, or not, or not. So that's the main point of the video. That's the purpose of the whole video, one can say. Uh, so what do you think? Henry, any views? Um, the first I'm thinking is like, um, the, what would the, the cause of the, of the supposition to, to collapse? Uh, is it uh, is it uh, is it a, is it consciousness or is it the measurement, um, so to speak, the, the act of measurement? I'm not sure. It seems that in the video, uh, the presenter proposes that there is an objective reality that there are. If you have two observers. The two observers say, say, the, say see the same thing, but they don't uh, influence the outcome. So there is an objective reality according to the presenter of this video, if I understood him correctly. Yes. Uh, yes, of course, a person can make uh, the quantum uh, thing happen, uh, the superposition to collapse. That, but that could equ equally as well be done with a machine, measuring instrument, or what have you. Mm. So there is no need for consciousness in the scheme of quantum mechanics. And, and it's also true that there was a later change uh, in quantum mechanics. It was striving more and more to say that the observer is not particular. Uh, participating and uh, it's the majority opinion today among quantum uh, physicists
so the question is was um Nis Bohr well, uh, one of the pioneers of the Copenhagen school and uh, of quantum physics uh, did he cause it wrong that the con uh, that the observer influences reality that is actually the the position of, of suppose yeah yeah the, the yeah, yeah very, today. very good very good and it's also the uh, the essence of what uh, uh, the presenter is saying is that uh, the original Niels Bohr was wrong, uh, and he also implying that he changes he changed his mind uh, to the correct view, which is the modern view that uh, consciousness does not play any role. He was the original pioneer thought that consciousness actually made the superposition collapse. So we are now in a cliff, cliffhanger. Yes. So, uh, so uh, what he's saying is that the tree falls in the wood, even if no one watches, observes it. Yeah, so, yeah, you can say that, you say that. The so-called object reality. Mm -hmm, of objects. Well, I, I'm going to start easy here. Uh, that's not the view of uh, Sir Roger Penrose, though. And the problem is, this I mentioned before, ex posteriori, ex anteriori. You can view any collapse of the superposition ex posteriori and ex anteriori. And if you choose to do it ex posteriori, there will be no mystery. Consciousness will have no part to play at all. So it's where you start and the presenter who himself is a doctor in physics, uh, Dowd is his name. He can tell the, those things apart, obviously. He mixes them, ex posteriori and ex anteriori. And uh, that's the general position, uh, not to upheld the difference. And if you don't do that, it you will be uh, back to classical physics. So even quantum mechanics will be back to that. And uh, it won't cause any problems because the only time you have to put in the observer is when you do the calculation and you do it as Alan Emre uh, mentioned the other day, you do it so quickly, it goes, goes unnoticed more or less. So no longer any need for putting the observer into the game. And uh, uh, when you come to think about it, it's, gonna, it's going to make physics very messy if you put the observer into physics. Uh, and it's, it's going to make the explanations non, not so credible anymore. But uh, uh, the position I have and the position of Sir Roger Penrose is this is, <laughs> It's very important if it's before or after, not temporarily, but uh, after the fact, so to speak, which can actually be in the future. It doesn't matter. And that's the whole problem. We need to establish what is before and what is after. Everything is decided after. And if you put on a format for what's going to happen, you already decided what's going to happen. And who does that? You do that. It's the choice of the observer. So we cannot still take the observer off. So it's more of a uh, ontological question or a philosophical question, or why not epistemological question? Still, the only thing this uh, Dr. Dowd did was to move the observer one step away and thereby he's so far away you don't have to count on him anymore so it's missing the point misses the point that Niels Bohr made and he misses the discussion was that was in between Einstein and Niels Bohr as well well you can write to him and ask if this is, is, this is so incredibly simple, why did not Einstein and Niels Bohr agree that? 
why would they have this falling out of each other? Why would they discuss years in Copenhagen and in Solvay in Brussels? Why would this go on? And uh, then it happens again many years later. We take the observer away and we forget who is deciding that we are going to do something ex posteriori or ex anteriori. And what, once that is forgotten, seems salabim or abracadabra. Once more, the observer is gone, no longer needed. It's a very convenient forgetfulness. But it's a bit more than forgetfulness. It's a horrible fact to, to digest that you, these people can't, we, we can't stomach it. Or so generally we can't stomach it. We want the observer to be gone <laughs> out of the equation. And it makes for, uh, I think you mentioned that, Henrik, it makes for a much more civilized science, more respectable. And this flimsy, uh, thing with the observer having a participating role in quantum physics. What do you think? I'm thinking of these two words you're, you're repeating, uh, ex posteriori, ex anteriori, was it? Yeah. Can you talk about that for a layman, what you mean? Well, uh, these needs to be firmly established. It's not, that cannot be explained. Uh, you get a feeling of them after a while. It takes a while. Is it, is it the same as ex implicit, explicit that Bohm no, talks no, about? No, 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 it's not. Edward de Bono was talking about this as well. And uh, I can give an example here. It's, it's not going to be very helpful. But um, if you want to make an, an invention, and he was talking very much about creativity, that was his tool, Edward de Bono. And uh, what you need could be um, possibly a new tool for uh, detecting uh, uh, radioactivity in the ground. Uh, I think that's a quite fitting uh, because where we're standing, there is uh, actually quite a lot of radioactivity, thanks for the uh, slate they've been using to make the hill. Uh, we're not in danger, so you don't have to be worried. But if you want to make a better detector, uh, and you think you're using creativity, you use as uh, De Bono would have called asymmetric thinking, a thinking that breaks the patterns. And De Bono often, often compare that to humor. Humor breaks a pattern that's established. Humor breaks the path that consciousness is taking, the whole path of consciousness, the structure, the causality, everything gets breaking. And in this breaking point, we have creativity. And oh, wow, I invent, I come with the idea how to make this new machine to measure radioactivity. Then somebody asks me, or I ask myself, or I need to put it on print. Now I gonna go back from where I have the invention, when I already have the invention, mm -hmm. where I already made the discovery. I will go back in time and I will explain explain in causality, in logical steps, how I came to the invention. How did this idea occur? Mm -hmm. And you can do that up ex posteriori. But what you can't do is do the same thing ex anteriori. When you're sitting and don't have the discovery and you don't have the invention, but it's ex posteriori afterwards. Hmm. So when you don't have the invention, you can't use logic, you can't use causality to get to the position. But you can do that after ex posteriori. It will be even easier to do that. 
And one way of explaining that that is not completely correct, but we, we, can, we can call uh, the invention point I for invention. And point B is before. So if you are in point B and wants to make the invention, can you use logic? Can you make use causality to get to I, the invention, before the invention was made? If and you invent the time machine and move forward in time, then you can create the logic. Wait here. And when you give this question to academics, uh, we know uh, De Bono made this investigation. It's a staggering 80-90% that says yes. 80-90%. And that is actually the common conception. The common conception is you can do that. You can get to the invention beforehand by using causality, by using logic, by using other rules. But I think uh, in this case, uh, we can focus on causality because this is uh, causality that the chap is talking about in the video, PBS video. De Bono claimed you cannot, and actually you cannot. And one way of going about that is that there are so many roads going from B, that is before point, to the invention, to the invention. There are so many roads. There are an infinity of roads, yes, you could yes. say. But that's not 100% correct, but it's correct enough to give a metaphor so you understand. The roads are so many, but afterwards, there is only one road. Once you made the invention, there is only one road. Well, you could make other roads. That's actually proven by Gurdon. But the thing is, you cannot get to point A from B. There's no possibility. We know that. It's proven. And this is this very fact they forget, but we all forget that. So there's no wonder nobody's talking about this. There's no wonder that this man says it as well, because it takes a long time to establish a thinking that is sharp enough to not mix ex posteriori and ex anteriori. And when you have it, you can lose it the next day. And if you start talking to people, you might lose it once more. But it is still the point of Sir Roger Penrose, and it was the point of, uh, well, let's say the earlier Niels Bohr. Uh, Schrödinger actually stuck to it. And so did John Bell, although he didn't want to. And so did Gödel. So there are at least five people who agree with me. <laughs> I get to think of my first programming uh, lecture in the 90s, and we get a lab task. Uh, I think it's C, or C, it's not C++, only C sharp, I think we are going to program. And uh, every start, everyone starts doing the, the lab, and yeah. everyone comes up with different codes and different solutions, but they mm -hmm. many reach, solves the problem. So you get the result with different ways of coding. That, that was an aha mm -hmm. moment for me that no, no one writes the exact same code to, to create no. the same result. Aha. Uh -huh. Very interesting. So, so there are many ways, as you say, to, to solve a problem. Mm, I didn't say that. Uh, to get the, to the invention, I wasn't exactly saying that, but to, to get to the invention of these yeah. new things, it looks very easy afterwards. Yes. I mean, there, you... are, there are, of course, more effective ways. I mean, you, can, you could do a, a measure for radioactivity measurement instrument in a more complex way or a simple way. That's what I'm saying. You could make it a very yeah. advanced, uh, sensitive, Post yeah, or, or less sensitive. Yeah. Less I think, yeah, yeah, I understand what you say. But for this example, to be absolutely clear, but De Bono is thinking, uh, I'm quite certain of that, or was thinking, he's gone now, uh, about an invention that only had one solution. It could be the molecule of calculé. It can't, it, it can't be done in, in, in another way. Um, 
uh, but you could, of course, you correct there, Henry. But to make it absolutely clear, uh, let's think of an invention that only has one solution or one problem that only has one solution. And the Kekulé molecule for benzene uh, is, is, there is no other one. But the more important thing is like, there is only one, uh, once you found it, the, the, the way is obvious, it's easy. Ah. Penicillin. Yeah, 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 yeah. Penicillin is another example. I also uh, get to think of antibiotics. Yeah, Wasn't yeah. That's a complete uh, random thing. He, he went on vacation yeah. and left the pad with uh, the solution in it uh, open for some reason. He forgot to close yeah. it. And yeah, he, when he, he, he came he, back, he, it was there comes some bacteria or something in the in there. So so suddenly antibiotics was invented. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he, he, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. It was complete happenstance. And of course, it was uh, uh, not only the caused by the happenstance alone, but it's obvious in this case, if it wouldn't have happened, Fleming never would have come with the solution or the invention of penicillin. Mm. He need to do some thinking as well. And that thinking was asymmetrical. And once it was done, mm. there you are. And uh, actually, penicillin, that could have been invented 100 years earlier. Not a problem. We had the microscope. We had the, the devices to do it. But it never happened. So we needed him to forget his, uh, I think it was uh, a soup of uh, a bowl of bouillon, his uh, lunch, uh, lunch bouillon. He forgot. So, so, so we could say that... Uh this guy in the video, he makes a uh, false claim when he says that uh, most uh, modern scientists, or perhaps most scientists, but the most famous today, Sir Rose Penrose, would not agree with him. Well, I, I'd say he, he has a point there. He's right. Mm. Yeah, the majority does. A uh, majority, majority, yes, but does, perhaps not the most famous. No, not Sir Rose Penrose. But it doesn't really matter because uh, uh, that mistake is built in into our education system. And that was one of the critics that De Bono had. Uh, we have a way of going about teaching things to people that the solution is already, re already somewhere. <laughs> and then we say, solve this problem. Uh, for, in for instance, mathematics is taught that way and physical problems are taught that way. And that creates the solution uh, that creates the illusion, sorry, the illusion that the truth is out there, as they say in uh, X Factor. Uh, it was called X Factor, Mulder and Scalder. Yes. The TV series. X Archives, yep. Yeah. Uh, X Files. Uh, and this is actually the, exactly the same principle as Socrates. I think that's a good one in his dialogues. What he wants to show to uh, uh, his disciples is the truth has already been there. It's all, always been there. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Socrates in fact himself thinks that. And he's also teaching that. But I, I can make an example. Actually, in Japan, it's quite unusual to give students problems that has a fixed solution or a ready-made solution. They prefer to give them problems that are either uh, seen as unsolvable or doesn't have a fixed solution. Whereas in Western tradition, we make a pedagogical point of having problems with a solution because it would be unfair to the shit. There's a lot of reasoning during the whole thing. And there's a war going on uh, within didactics about this. Because, of course, it'd be much harder for the students and they can get discouraged. But there's no doubt, and I think the most, most pedagogic will agree me on this point, that we, we do have a tendency to create a, <laughs> an illusion that the solution is already there. And most obvious, I'd say, that's, this is my opinion, the presenter of the video from PBS he is of that opinion. And he shares that opinion with the absolute majority of the quantum physicists today. But it was not the opinion of the early pioneers of quantum mechanics. Yes, 
to some degree, they changed their mind. I know what he means. Uh, the Copenhagen interpretation sounds and uh, looks like a change of mind. It is officially, but uh, internally, Bohr, Schrödinger, Heisenberg didn't change their mind, and it didn't uh, Bro De Broly didn't do it either. But obviously, the presenter read the Copenhagen interpretation. But, but how do you know that? How do you know that they didn't change? I don't. I don't. I don't know if he read the Copenhagen interpretation. But if he's done his job correct, he has done that. That's correct way of going about things. He shouldn't say that I believe that Niels Bohr didn't change his mind or that he did change his mind. Well, he's, that's his, uh, he's implying that, but he, he doesn't exactly say that that and that person changed his mind. I said, he says that they did change their mind, but he doesn't specify who did. But uh, Bohr didn't change his mind. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Uh, you can read his memoirs. He, if you don't he discusses uh, von Neumann and uh, what is the other guy? Yeah. Wiegener. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, as, a, as an odd thing, uh, if he would have done the video in some other way, he would have been incorrect in certain aspects, actually. So the, the video is correctly performed. He has to go to the Cop Copenhagen interpretation. He, he, uh, I, the whole thing is very interesting. Uh, uh, and uh, it was a very, very good, very good video, uh, Henry. Very good uh, video, very, very good suggestion. And this goes to show how complicated, uh, I don't know if complicated is the right word, but it's, it's some difficulty to the, the whole thing. But uh, yeah, I think it could be helpful to uh, understand that De Bono had the same problem uh, when he, in the book, uh, You Are Right, I'm Wrong. Uh, no, I'm right and you are wrong. Uh, oh, yeah, De Bono, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He did, he, most people didn't get it either. It's a very difficult thing to explain because it slips out of your hands. It's a little bit like when you are very young, you need to learn which hand is the right and which hand is the left. And you have a period when you're young and it's so hard to tell which it is. And then some adult says, well, it's the hand you, you shake hello with. And then you think you, you have it if you test it. Uh, but if all of a sudden somebody asks you, you will lose it again. But now uh, when I'm an adult, I never lose it anymore. Uh, this is the same with the ex posteriori, ex anteriori. It will be a long time when you, it slips out of your hands. And if you, uh, if you get, get a, attacked in arguments, it will slip out of your hand as well. Guaranteed. There's no doubt about it. It's, a, it's very slippery in the beginning. It needs to be firmly established. And that goes from De Bono. Uh, and uh, that was also the point, both of Nils Erik Bohr and his son, Orge Bohr, at least. Well, very interesting video. Thank you very much, Henrik, for that one. Thank you, Henrik. <clears throat> okay. Can round up here. <clears throat> yes, we can round up. We don't have any more questions or discussions. Well, okay. Uh, thank you very much, listeners. Thank you, Henry, for the excellent tip with this. Uh, uh, well, let's have a discussion, and we, we should put up uh, the link to the video from yes, PBS yes. Things and Time. And uh, I, I need to add, also, all those videos are excellent. They put a lot of money and a lot of work into them. And uh, in most specific ways, this video is completely correct, uh, uh, but uh, in some other way, it's not correct. Uh, it's very interesting, it makes it even more interesting. Uh, but I, 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 oh, thank you very much for me. Yeah. Thank you, Guy. Thank you. I will look at it once again, I think. Okay, yes. cheers. Cheers, bye-bye. Okay. Bye. -bye. bye.